troubles call for more grace than I can afford. But where can I go but to my dear Savior for mercy that pours from boundless doors? Grace upon grace, every sin repair, every void restored.
We're going to review last week's question in light of this week's question. Last week's question was, what is sin? Sin is any transgression of the law of God. Very good. So this week's question is, what is meant by transgression? Doing what God forbids. Very good. In Hosea, in chapter 6, verse 7 says, But like Adam, they have transgressed the covenant. There they have dealt treacherously against me. So sin is any transgression of the law of God. Doing what God forbids is what a transgression is. So children, what is meant by transgression? Doing what God forbids. Doing what God forbids. Very good. Good morning, church. Let's stand together. Um, let's sing this song. This is a uh, just a rehearsal of gospel truths, and they're they're personal, and they're just um, uh, one right after another. Just uh, being amazed at these uh, uh, these amazing truths. So let's sing them as if they are amazing to us. So uh, let's. Uh, so sorry. I am so. Does it sound good yet? This here it is, here it is. Here it is, here it is. I found it. Sorry, guys. So much for distraction-free. Is that better? Okay. Anyway, amazed, right? Um, amazing love. This is Sing the Salary. When can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me, caused his pain.
good to see you all today. Having been gone last week and still have my cough this morning, I was telling uh, Hunter that I took a shot at Delson so this morning, so if I wander off in my sermon, uh, forgive me and uh, just uh, redirect me. Michelle, give me the, the signal. This morning we celebrate Christ who is all and who is in all who uh, he has made new. It's in Christ Jesus that we have a new life. It's in him that we are connected to, to life in God. It's a life of being, that is being renewed day by day uh, in his image. If you have a copy of God's word, let's turn in our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. This morning for our call to worship, I want us to read verses 17 through 32. This is actually a parallel passage uh, to our passage in Colossians. In fact, a lot of that you read in uh, Ephesians, you'll find in Colossians chapter 3, they, they parallel one another uh, quite a bit. Before we read that, however, I want us to pray. I'd like us to pray for the Eller family that's in the Czech Republic this morning. And I'd like us to also uh, uh, continue to pray for Providence Baptist Church uh, you'll recall that's Andy Woodard. They have been meeting as a church in New York in person despite the, the governor's orders. And um, <clears throat> just this week we're able to, because of the, the, the laws or the, the Supreme Court uh, decision that's been made, now they can, they can meet without feeling like they're doing something wrong or against uh, um, Governor Cuomo's uh, wishes. I also want to pray for the preaching of the word. Join with me now. Pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we get to gather as this church today to worship you, to come before you, to sing praises of, of worship, to hear your word proclaimed, to know that you are pleased with us, God, to have given to us your spirit, to indwell us, to fight sin, to renew us, uh, and to, uh, to, to work in our lives, to cause us to, to be made and conform to the image of your Son. We come this morning, Lord, as a church gathered to pray. We want to pray this morning for the Eller family in the Czech Republic. And we ask, God, your blessing upon them to help them uh, as they continue in language study and in uh, just getting uh, closer to the churches that are around there to be accepted. Father, we pray that your hand of blessing and favor would be upon them. Uh, we pray for Josh that you'd give him opportunity to minister your gospel, to proclaim with clarity. We pray, Lord, just for them, that you bless them. Thank you, Lord, for this family. And Father, we want to lift up, as a church, we want to lift up Providence Baptist Church uh, in Manhattan. And God, we ask that you would bless them. Thank you, Lord, for their faithfulness. Thank you for the faithfulness of uh, our brother Andy Woodard in leading his church to, to meet despite the government's orders. We ask, God, your blessing upon them, that you would grow their church Lord, that you would add to their number uh, solid believers that are ready to step in to the, to the areas that they need leadership. Uh, Father, qualified men, and, and Lord, we just pray, God, that you would bless their evangelism efforts as they proclaim your gospel and they hand out tracts in uh, the area. God, just bless, we pray, bless Providence Baptist Church. This, Lord, this morning, we want to lift up the preaching of the word. We pray, God, as we dive into Colossians chapter 3, that you would equip us, Lord, that you would build upon our spiritual houses uh, areas that we can now walk in, that we can go to and to understand more fully what your word has said, and it affect us, Lord. We pray, Lord, as we grow in our identity, understanding of our identity in Christ, Lord, that we can put away our, our anger, we can put away our, our malice, our wrath, Lord, these ways in which we have formerly thought, Lord, to put them away and to pursue you. We ask for your favor this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and read together Ephesians chapter 4, beginning at verse 17. This is God's word. So this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. 
And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But you did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you have heard Him and have been taught in Him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And do not give the devil an opportunity. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with the one who has need. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. This is God's Word. There is now a hope that lasts beyond our day. was very lives again now the tomb is bare and empty and the stone is rolled away praise the risen one who overcame the grave Jesus is 
leaving him so as we as we uh, sing these let's uh, think in terms of this being our old man our, our old self is dying there on that cross with him and then uh, raised to new life as the new self um, just uh, let those word pictures play out personally for you is what I'm trying to say when the fields are dry and the winter is long blessed are the meat hungry the poor when my soul is downcast my voice has no song for mercy for comfort I wait on the Lord in the harvest feast or the fallow ground my certain hope is in Jesus found my heart my cup my Thank you. 
Turn in your Bibles to the book of Colossians, Colossians chapter 3. Let's read from the beginning of the chapter through verse 11, and then we'll pray. Paul writes, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. And here's our focal text, verse 8. But now you also put them also aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, 
circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and freeman, but Christ is all and in all. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, I thank you that we are identified with you, that we are with you on the cross, that we accompany you to the grave, and through the the power of the resurrection, we are alive from the dead. I thank you that our old self has been nailed to the cross. Our old body of work, our, our deeds of death that we committed against you, Lord, that they are dead. That we have been raised to, to new life. We are new creatures in you. We've been born again. We've been given new hearts. No longer to de- desire the, the old ways, the old path, Lord, but to pursue you in righteousness and in truth. Lord, increase our vision as a church, as Christians, Lord, that we would know who we are in you and we would put these things away. We ask this in your name. Amen. Do you all know what the order of salvation is? The ordo salutis, have you heard that, that phrase before? Depending on your theological, you know, your, your, your thoughts, if you're Catholic, if you're Lutheran, if you're uh, Baptist, if you're Calvinistic, you're going to have perhaps a, a varying different order of salvation. And I probably should write this on the board, but I'm not just for the sake of time. But this is the order of salvation that we as a church uh, are going to teach. There's going to be some variation in there. And it's not a variation in terms of time. It's a variation in terms of a logical order in the way that people think through these. And it goes something like this. God from eternity past before the foundations of the world has predestined to save a people. And he has elected, so the first one is predestination. The second one is election. He has chosen who it is that he will save. And there comes a point, a time in their life where he calls them. This is the uh, the, the Spirit's effectual calling, where he calls them to salvation. And they come to life. They are regenerated is the next one. And then they have faith. And then they repent of their sins. And then God justifies them in his courtroom room and he adopts them and brings them into his family now as sons and daughters and then they are sanctified and they persevere and then one day they will be glorified so you hear that order predestination election calling regeneration faith repentance justification adoption sanctification perseverance and glorification where does your old life your former life fit into that scheme as you think about that time frame god before i existed predestined and he elected and then there's a point in time where where someone has shared the gospel uh with me and the spirit of god has joined with that proclamation to speak the truth to me and i have been effectually called but there was a point in time prior to that that I have been walking uh, in, in my sin and walking after the manner of the Gentiles and walking after these, these old ways. And during this time, I have formed habits and, and, and ways in which I deal with the world around me. Conflict comes in my life. And how do I deal with that conflict? Many of us, if you're like me, have learned to deal with the conflict in our life through anger. That I, that I just erupt in anger when conflict happens around me. And, and because of that, I mean, I can, I can foam pretty hot pretty quick. And so I can, uh, I can have a, an outburst of anger. Is that, is that you? Is that, is that, am I the only one that's ever struggled with that former manner of life and the habits that I've learned? I've learned to abdicate. I remember as a young man uh, 
sitting with a group of men in accountability and talking about the fact that I did not know how to play with my own children because of the abdication that I had seen in my own father who didn't, didn't uh, spend time with me at all. His way of, of dealing with me was just to give me a gift whenever he saw me. And so I, I grew up not knowing how to even uh, interact with my kids, and I learned a sinful pattern of abdication with my kids. And when my kids didn't do what I wanted them to do, I mirrored what my father did in my life and get really angry when, when something would happen. Does that resonate with anybody? We have, in this time prior to coming to Christ, we have formed ways in which we sin against other people. And now we are in this process of what the Ordo Salutis here says, sanctification and and, uh, perseverance. It's during this time where Christ has done a work in my life. I have new desires. I I, I don't want to walk in the old ways anymore. And yet, I am being sanctified and being made to look like Him. We have many sinful examples in our lives. We have many sinful paths that we have pursued. Our passage calls out six ways we respond to others and then seemingly just says, yeah, yeah don't do that anymore. Stop stop doing that. As though that's a sufficient uh, amount to overcome the the years of habit that I have uh, incurred or that you have incurred. I don't know about you, but I've spent an awful lot of time cultivating my sin. I've spent an awful lot of time cultivating the way that I've done it. So it's just to say stop it seems insufficient to actually get me to stop. Let's dig into our text and let's see how the, the, the point here that the Apostle Paul is making and how powerful that is for us to reflect upon and to understand. Now I had trouble breaking this up you i I talked to tanner last night i talked to other people how do i divide this section up because you want your passage that you're exegeting to just break like a gem and there's these beautiful spots and this isn't one of those today i'm going to form a sentence so if you're taking notes i want you to leave room for three categories we're going to talk about these old practices then we're going to talk about new people and then the new pursuit And this is the sentence that it forms. One, we're going to put off old practices. Two, because we are a new people. Three, that have a new pursuit. Let's form that sentence together. Let's look first at put off the old practices. Verses 8 and 9a. Let's read this. It says, but now you also put them all aside. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech from your mouth, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another. That's the, that's the list that we're looking at. This is the second vice list, as it were. We looked at the first vice list here a couple weeks ago. You'll see that in verse 5. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. Paul admonishes us concerning six interconnected areas that can mark the Christian life after they have been regenerated, after they have been uh, justified, after they've experienced a conversion of faith and repentance, they can yet still wrestle with these items. Let's look at them together. The first one here is Anger. Anger. Now this word means uh, impulse. It means wrath. And by implication, this is to stir up vengeance within a person, to punish, to come down hard, to to bring down uh, the hammer, as it were. Now interestingly, this word, anger, is the same word that Paul uses in verse 6 where it talks about the wrath of God. 
You'd think it would use the word wrath in a different way, but this is the same word. This anger is, uh, that this word that's translated anger here is also found in Romans chapter 1 and verse 18 where it says, for the wrath, this word anger, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. The implication here is to express this type of anger is to uh, usurp God's position, is to, uh, to take his divine right, what he is exclusively for him to foam so hot and so angry that you are taking his place. The second word here is wrath. That's translated wrath. This word also means passion. This is where we get this idea of breathing hard, not in a, in a sexual way, but in an angry, just snorting through the nostrils type of, of, of anger. This, there's, a, there's a fierceness here, an indignation, uh, wrath as it's defined. Dear friends, this is your outburst of anger. This is, I would like to, I could do some illustration, but you know, you know what I'm talking about. You've had this experience. Something has happened around you and you have, you have flashed so hot that your nostrils flare and out comes the, that breath and, and, and indignation comes forth. We see this example in uh, Acts 19.28. It says, When they heard this and were filled with rage, that phrase, filled with rage, they began crying out, saying, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! The entire crowd was so feel, filled with rage. And the emphasis here is that this type of anger, this type of wrath that's coming out of a person is uncontrolled. That's what we saw with the, 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 them in Ephesians, or in the... Uh, in Ephesus there, as they went on for hours ch- chanting the same thing, no one could check them. No, no one could to control them. Have you experienced that type of anger before? I don't know, I'm looking around, I see some nods. The next word we see is malice. This word means wickedness. It just means wickedness, evil. The idea is ill will, a desire to injure. In 1 Peter 2.16, it says, Act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, for malice, but use it as a bond slaves of Christ. The emphasis here is that your anger and your wrath and your indignation has so fomented that you are desiring or wishing bad things would happen to the person that has injured you or has done something you did not like. This is when you want the person that has just passed you in the car and is speeding past you. Your desire is that, oh, wouldn't it be nice if a cop was here? And saw him and got him as you speed as well, but just not as fast as they're going. I've never done that, by, by the way. This next one is slander. This is a word we know. I won't give you an example of this, but the word slander there, it's just blasphemy in Greek. We know that word very well, blasphemy. It's vilification. It's speaking evil of someone. It's to injure their good name is the idea, if we blaspheme against God, we are bringing, his, uh, we, we're bringing reproach to his name. We're speaking ill of God. We dare not do that. But we blaspheme one another. We slander one another. And the emphasis here is to speaking of others in such a way that their character is questioned. Where we're sowing doubt as to their hearts, as to their motives. And we're sowing that doubt in those that we're speaking to about that person. The next one is abusive speech. This is uh, the use of improper words. 
This word is actually a unique word to this, but we can, by its root, find other sources to help us understand. But its meaning is, is foul speaking or, or low and obscene speech. It's vile conversation. It's dishonorable speech. Now, I found a verse that I, I want to bring out. It's, this is Ephesians 5, 11 and 12. And it says, Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful. Now that word disgraceful is the front word to our, to our other word. It's disgraceful speech. It is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. And the emphasis on speaking here in a way that about someone where we're not building them up. Our goal isn't to, to build this person up. Rather, we are being disrespectful of them and we are dishonoring them. Now, in your translation, it may translate this as dirty or, or filthy speech. And the implication is this is coarse jesting. This is perhaps talking in, a, in, a, in an inappropriate way in that sense. And, and that's certainly... Could be, but it could just be plain old disrespect. Speaking of a, a, of a customer, for example, in a way uh, with your work crew that demonstrates your disdain for the person that you are working with. It, it could be mocking someone where you're just talking about something and you're laughing at them or, or you make fun of something about them. Perhaps it's the way they speak. Perhaps it's the way they look. But you're speaking in an inappropriate, disrespectful way. This is abusive speech. And the final one here is, finds us uh, going over into the next verse. Do not lie to one another. We know what that is. We don't need to look up Greek definitions to figure out what it means to lie. It's just to deceive with a falsehood, with an untruth. These are the, the list. It's a list that, that I know well. From my former walk, from my former life, before Christ saved me, I, I have walked in this path. And if I'm to confess to my church, I have walk this path after regeneration as well. I have found myself flaming hot, following after a course and action and path that I have gone before too often. Where do we see this path? You know, I look around this room and I think about us as a church and I'm like, well, we, I don't do that. I don't do that with Jeff. Well, maybe. But I don't do that with each other. We don't do that with each other. Where we see that in the life of our fellowship, I think, is in a couple areas. And one of the big areas is, is in, in our marriages. Where our, our anger flares up so much that, that Bert and I are called to, to sit at the dining room table while the cops are there. I've seen it. Anger flares up between our spouses. You know where else it flares up? See, as a church, we get together, uh, as leaders, we get together every Friday morning and we pray for the souls of Ref Church. And that soul list, it, it, is, it, it is increased ex exponentially for us. And our prayer time is now closer to like an hour of praying. But in that souls list, Every soul is here, including all of our children. And, and one of the areas that I believe we see this type of anger and, and uh, wrath and malice and slander and abusive speech is happening between our parents and our kids and our children and their parents. I see it. It's easy to flash hot in these moments to see these types of things happen. Of course, we know where all of this comes from. The inward, uh, this is inward before it's ever outward. And this is a reference we look at a lot. Mark chapter 7, verse 20 through 23, it says, And he was saying, 
that which proceeds out of this Jesus, that which proceeds out of the man, uh, out of the man, that is what defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed the evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All of these evil things proceed from within, and they defile the person. We see it. We see where this is, this is coming from. Let me make some proposals to you. Having studied this topic, having read books, having thought a lot about this, having counseled other people through this, having been accountability partners for others, you know where anger comes from? Anger comes from our pride. Where pride is, you, you, you'll see anger flaring up. It's when our desires become demands. And in James, James talks about this in chapter 4 and verse 1 and 2. He says, What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is it not that your pleasures, your desires, that wage war in your members? You lust and you do not have. You, you've got this desire. You want something and you don't have it, so what do you do? So you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. Our desires, sometimes they're good and right desires. I desire to be respected by my family. And when my desire for respect is, becomes a, a, a demand, I can flame so hot and to yell at my own family, my own wife, my children, to express my anger that you better respect me. My desire has become this, this monster, this thing that's here. Uh, we can have good desires uh, of, of just our fellowship, of, of, of different things. And any time a desire that we have becomes a demand and our pride is inflamed, we can sin in this way. This is an easy path. Anger leads to all manner of internal sin and then verbal sin. That's the commonality between all of these categories is that they become words. They become something. Now, in your anger, what are you willing to do? And you might think, well, I'm not willing to kill anybody. Right? Of course not. No, I'm not willing to do that. And what are you willing to think about? I'm not willing to, I'm not willing to even entertain the idea of actually killing someone of course not and that's not me i'm being honest with you i would I, I wouldn't do that but there's something in our culture and there's something the way we treat other people that we're willing to say things that we wouldn't do boy i'm gonna beat you within an inch of your life i already shared it with you guys what my mom used to say to me and i can say it now because she's not gonna know i said it but she would say, boy, I'm going to rip your arms off. I'm going to beat you with those bloody stumps. That's what my mom told me. Now, I knew she was joking. What, what a joke. We, we do this, though, in our culture. We're willing to articulate things that we would never really entertain. Is that what Paul's talking about here? The way that we speak to one another in, 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 a, in a malicious way way, in a wrathful way, in an angry way, to abuse one another, to manipulate each other, to lie to one another. Friends, I, I, I'm concerned that it's happening. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech, and lying are all the ways that we deploy, all the things that we to deploy to manipulate others to do the things that we want them to do or need them to do. Why do you lie? Why do I lie? 
Lying comes from self-preservation. I don't want to look bad, so I'm going to say I did the X, Y, and Z. Or I don't want to expose what really happened, so I'm going to characterize it a certain way. And we lie to one another. Enough of that. Friends, the good news here is that Paul is addressing Christians. That's good news to me. Meaning that that Christians are going to struggle with these kind of things. That means they, they just not even connect in your mind. Because these are horrific things. Paul says to put off these practices as though they're not lifetime habits. As though they're just sins that we started doing yesterday. Let's see the power of what he's saying. Let's look at this next, let's form our sentence and and look at this next point because we are new people. We put off these old practices. Why? Because we're new people. Look at verse 9. It says, do not, well, put off all these sins since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self. Here and in, in, in our call to worship passage, Paul gives us another illustration of the transformative work that happens in the believer's life. And this idea of the old man, new man is synonymous with regeneration. Remember our order of salvation. It's synonymous with this idea of regeneration, of being born again. And we often go over these, but, but real quick, I want us to recall all these synonyms, of these the synonymous terms and concepts. Listen to this. The believer has his Heart of stone removed and a heart of flesh given to them, according to Ezekiel. The believer is born again. They've experienced new birth, not of water and not of blood, but of the Spirit of the living God has has caused us to be born again, according to John chapter 3. The believer is given the Holy Spirit of God as a seal and as a down payment, and up from within them bubbles up a a well of living water, according to the Scriptures. The believer is what? He is a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. All of these terms are synonymous, meaning they all refer to the same event in the life of the believer. God, being rich in mercy, binds us to His Son, Jesus, and kills us with Jesus upon the cross. From God's perspective, Jerry and Dustin and Michelle and Jeff, all of us here who profess to know Him, with all of our anger, with all of our wrath, with all of our malice, with all of our slander, our abusive speech and our lying, and along with verse 5, all of our our immorality, our impurity, our passion, our evil desire, our greed, and all of our idolatry, all these dead works, along with the man who did them, is nailed to the cross. We are crucified with Christ. Our old person is dead and buried. And as believers... What is present in this room are new men and women, new creatures with new hearts experiencing new birth indwelt by His Holy Spirit. That's who we are. The old person is dead and and new people are alive. 
And so Paul explains in Ephesians chapter 2, 4 and 5, it says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, makes us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And in Galatians 2.20, Paul, furthering this thought, says this. He says, I, he, Paul, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live. But Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. Friends, this old man, new man paradigm is a settled reality. It's settled. It's finished. It's done. Paul says, since this has happened, since this has all happened, church, let me ask you this question. How many times have you been born again? One time. You, You don't, you don't, You're not born again over and over and over again. How many times have you received a new heart? How many times have you wandered off in your sin again and your heart has become calloused and old and dead and God now has to give you a new heart again? This is not how it works. This is a one-time event. Regeneration is one time. How many times have you been dead and you're now alive? That's a... A concept that many have in terms of backsliding and going away from God and, and coming back and I'm born again again and I'm born again again and again and, and, and it loses all meaning. Friends, we mistakenly think that because I find myself engaged in sinful behaviors that I am still the old man. And that's not your reality. That's not who you are. Paul has a different perspective and one that will help you in your battle with old sinful patterns. Put off the old because that's not who you are. Stop it. That's not who you are. Imagine being poor. That's not hard for us, right? Imagine not having money to your name. In your whole life, you've learned to cheat the system. You lie. You steal. You manipulate others around you to give you a place to stay, to feed you, to give you 20 bucks here or there. You've learned how to manipulate everything. But... But one day you come into serious money, you receive a a check in the mail. And it turns out that you have a long lost aunt who lives in Oklahoma who recently passed away. And she and her family owned oil wells. And you don't have to do anything ever again. You receive a check from an oil company every month. Thousands of dollars are coming into your account and will perpetually. Because that's the, the, the reality. That's, the, that's what's happened to you. Friends, it's inappropriate for you to continue to cheat the system. And to go to your buddy and say, hey, can you loan me 20 bucks? Hey, just till, just till payday, can you give me 20 bucks? Can I crash at your place? Can I, can I hang out here for a while? Would you feed me a meal? while the while stealing from them, using the same methods as you, as you were in your poverty, it's wrong for you to do that. It's inappropriate for you to do that. Why? Because you're not poor. Why continue in the old ways to continue to walk and do the things that you did in that former life when you're no longer poor? Christian, put off anger because that's not who you are. 
Our life is in Christ. Anger and wrath are satisfied in Him. We entrust the outcomes that we need to happen to a sovereign God now. We're connected to God. We don't need to manipulate the outcomes anymore. Because of what has been secured for us in Christ. We no longer need to deploy our personal anger and our wrath and our malice and our slander and our abusive speech to bully people. Stop it! Rather, we now put on a heart of compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. Now I admit, Paul doesn't identify how one puts these old sins off. He just tells you why. But that why is very powerful. It's a powerful motivator. That, that why, it vacates our sinful patterns of their power. I don't need to do that anymore. I don't need to be angry anymore. I don't need to be wrathful. I don't need to think of ways to just to rejoice in the hurt and the pain that others will go through because they wronged me. Put that away. Don't do those things because that's not who you are in Christ. Now how we put them off may involve confession, as it has with me. It, it may involve confession. Confessing your sin to another brother is, is another way to vacate the, that sin of all of its power. Because it likes to lurk in the shadows. And when we reveal our sin to fellow brothers and sisters, it, it just flattens it and de deflates it. It may involve counseling. It may involve sitting down and thinking through and having someone walk through how it is that you have, uh, have learned this behavior to have an outburst of anger whenever your child doesn't pick up their toys. Why that just provokes you to uncontrollable wrath when the house is not clean enough for you. You may need counseling for somebody to walk, that, walk you through that. And you may need accountability. So the how you put this off may be more involved. But we know why we need to put it off. It's not who we are. You may need to get with a, a sister or you might need to get with your spouse, or you might need to get with a brother in Christ. Children, you may need to go to your parents to confess your rage. Parents, you may need to talk to your kids about these and, and confess your sin for your outbursts of anger towards your children. We're forming a sentence. We're putting off the old practices to because we are new people Let's consider third and finally, we are a new people that have a new pursuit. Let's look at that together. Let's look at Colossians chapter 10. I mean, Colossians 3 verse 10. It says, And have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him, a, renew, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, freeman, but Christ is all and in all. According to Paul, I am a new person in the process of being renewed. And together we are a, 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 a people joined in this renewal effort. If you've professed Christ, we are a new people. We're no longer that old person. The word here for renewal means uh, made new. As one alive from the dead, I am new. And I am being made new every day. Listen to me. The normal, everyday experience of the believer should be one of communion and fellowship with God. This is 
is the experience of eternal life, to know him, not tomorrow. Eternal life is not what we will experience once we die. Eternal life is for right now, to have fellowship with God, to be reunited, to be reconciled to him right now. And we know the goal of this renewal, which is, according to this verse, to be made new according to Christ Jesus' image. And I say that because remember what it says in verse 16 of chapter 1. It says, For by Him all things were created, speaking of Jesus, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. So we are being remade, we're being made new according to Christ's image. As believers, this is happening. God does not hide his work from us. And it's a work he began in us and one that he sees to completion. So we think of the order of salvation We are in sanctification and we will persevere unto glorification. This is his promise to us. He doesn't quit. And he uses the the means of this word given in chapter 3 and this word being proclaimed to you now to halt and assault your attention so that you take serious and you put off these things. This is the means of sanctification given to his church. I want you to imagine a, a group of people forced to gather multiple times a, a week who cross ethnic boundaries, who cross religious pra- practice boundaries, who uh, have education boundaries, who have civilized boundaries and they have economic boundaries that's what paul is pointing to in verse 11 when he talks about all these different groups that are existing in the church this church that he's speaking to at colossae is a collection of different tensions that ought to explode with anger and wrath and malice slander abusive speech and lying to one another it's a powder keg in and of itself, apart from Christ. But as Christ's followers, as believers in Jesus Christ, they and we have a new classification that unifies us in a common pursuit. We are those who have died and are now alive in pursuit of the one who has remade us. And collectively, we are putting off those behaviors that formerly occupied us and are pursuing Christ, who is all and in all of us. Though we have many barbarians in our church, that's not what unites us. We're not united because we're all barbarians. We're not united because we're all Scythians. What unites us as those alive from the dead is our pursuit of the one who created us, Jesus. That's what unites us as a church. That's what overcomes all of our differences is our common pursuit of Christ. Friends, I wonder how your marriages would change if you both saw each other as those alive from the dead in pursuit of Christ. I wonder how your parenting would change if you saw your children as sons and daughters in Christ. Christian, is that your experience? Is this what you're experiencing? Stop acting like you're poor. You're not poor anymore. Lying and manipulating to get by. You don't have to do that anymore. You're no longer the old you. In Christ, you've been made new. Act like it. Perhaps you're one who claims to be a Christian. 
But the idea of this transformative work that I'm talking of and that Scripture identifies in all of these different examples, being born again, going from death to life, all of that perhaps that's foreign to you, invites you to cry out to Christ. He will save you. He will rescue you. Perhaps this is the, the message, this is the, the time when you've heard this message today that He is effectually calling you to Himself and regenerating your heart and bringing you to Him, adopting you as His son or daughter. Repent of your sin, turn to Him today. and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray with me. Lord God, sanctify your church. Help us, Lord, to put away these practices. Help us to walk in the newness of life that you have secured for us. Thank you for regeneration. Thank you for this transformative work. Thank you for taking us from life or from death to life. Thank you for joining us with your Son on the cross and in the resurrection. In his name we pray. Amen.
before we go, just a couple of announcements. Friends, fellowship is essential. Just as much as going, uh, having Walmart open is essential or going to Kroger is essential. We meet as a church because church is essential and some of the things that are essential to church is the proclamation, proclaiming, preaching here. That's part of it. That's part of the reason that we come. But fellowship is essential as well. And so when we have fellowship meals or we do things as a church, as fellowship, those things are not under, they are not subject to our governor's uh, edicts to say we cannot meet in homes or do those kind of things. I'm sorry. And if that means that I'm going to be arrested for having you all come to my house this coming Saturday, so be it. But this Saturday from 8 to 10, we're going to have a fellowship meal, a breakfast at our place, and I want to invite everybody to come. If you're sick, don't come. Uh, if you need to wear a mask, wear a mask. If you don't want to wear a mask, don't wear a mask. It doesn't matter. We're gonna, let's meet and have fellowship and enjoy each other this coming Saturday. Um, so that's December 5th. Our prayer meeting is the following Wednesday. Not this coming Wednesday, but the following Wednesday. As many people as are here right now, let's fill this place on a Wednesday night and not leave it to a handful of 15, 20 people to pray through the membership roles and to pray for each one of us. We're going to try to entice you that night, but we shouldn't have to do this. But we are going to have a, a hymn sing that night, and we're going to have pizza ahead of time. So we want to have a little bit of a fellowship meal. We're going to sing hymns that night, and then we're going to pray for each other. That's the following Wednesday. And the last fellowship thing that I want to tell you about is happening New Year's Eve. We'll be at Bert's house, and we're going to have a great time out there at Cedarmore. Not just at your house. We're not going to enjoy the Cedarmore portion of it. Uh, if you've not been to a Burt Lace New Year's Eve party, he puts on a, a, a good time. We'll just have a time of uh, reflection, singing hymns again, and uh, ushering in the new year. So here this is our benediction, just the first three verses of our passage. It says, But now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is be re being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. Go with that thought.
seems long From this labor and this heartache I have come The skies will wear out But you remain the same Rock of ages I praise your name Rock of ages